My name is Nick Kohut. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dash Robotics, Inc. I'm Andrew Gillies. I'm a co-founder of Dash Robotics. The name of the business is Dash Robotics. Our first product is Kamigami Robots. We started the company to bring robots to the masses. We make fun, connected toy robots for kids age eight and up. We started the company ourselves by each investing $1,000 of our own money. $1,000 was a lot. We were all still in grad school when we started the company, so every penny counted. But it wasn't until we really raised our seed round of funding in April 2015, about $1.7 million, that the business really got going. We're building a complicated product. I'm incredibly proud of what we've done with such a small team. We're six full-time employees right now and uh, we've managed to get a product all the way from concept to on people's doorsteps all over the country. The most difficult part of running the company is just how many aspects there are to it, uh, which is something I really love, but you know, you have to build a complex product, you have to manage people, you have to do logistics, hiring. I mean, there's just so many things you have to do and learn and be good at, oh, I have to do email marketing now. You know, I'm an engineer, I've never done that before. We're really trying to reach that kid who's in early middle school, somewhere between grades four and grades seven. We really want to reach them at that early stage and get them into it and show them that, hey, robotics can be really fun. I would like to see us as a premier developer and provider of connected toys. We really see these first robots as the introduction for a new ecosystem of robots, an ecosystem that is affordable, that's fun, that's engaging. So we're going to Shenzhen for 12 days. We'll be meeting with manufacturers, other companies that we might want to partner with. So I'm really looking forward to any outdoor stuff or cultural stuff we do will be really exciting. I'm pretty excited to try the food in Shenzhen. Oh, this is awesome. Those are the brains of the operation. A little that on there. First day in Shenzhen here, this afternoon we visited a company called Three Glasses, a VR company, virtual reality company in Shenzhen. That was a really exciting thing to check out today. When we first visited the office, they set us up in this like a race car booth thing. It had like actuators on it and... So you strap the headset on, you sit in, in this seat here, and then you're pretty much on a roller coaster. Oh boy. <laughs> We're going up now. Oh boy. Oh god. <laughs> it was really impressive how realistic it feels. Like, I thought that when I was going to go down, that it would feel like I was going down for a second when this thing jerks, and then it would just feel normal. But actually, you really feel like you're going down the whole time. Whoa! Woo! <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. It's incredible how immersive the whole thing is. Like the roller coaster kind of pitches up on an angle and you actually feel like you're sitting back in your seat, like falling back in this thing. And you definitely get, as you go over the top, that pit in the bottom of your stomach kind of lifting up as it jerks over. Oh, yeah. oh here comes the water. Oh. <laughs> here we go. Hello. 
Then we were uh, greeted by the CEO. The office is beautiful. It's very much sort of Silicon Valley style office. Nice plants and decor. They have apparently just over 100 employees and growing now, so you can imagine the space is pretty bustling. So we met some of their software developers, some of the hardware developers. Uh, we talked to a few of their artists because they also do content. And they've been in that game for a long time. They founded in 2002. In the last few years, they've really dove headfirst into the hardware space, making VR headsets. Okay. So they had a few different generations, uh, D1, D2, S1, I think just came out. They're working on the S2 now. The latest version, even when you're jerking your head around really quick, the tracking was like really crisp. We played a couple different games with that. Yeah. <laughs> One of the controllers they showed us that was really cool was something you hold in your hand and it has accelerometer, gyroscope, and compass inside of it. So when you move it around, you can make things move around in the screen in that same orientation. It's actually something we're working on for our robots as well. So this is their motion tracker, so you can track where your hands are when you're in VR. You can control different objects or, you know, like shoot a gun or hold a lantern or... Yeah. And then uh, this is uh, the Ford... A sensor that picks up the motion of your hands when you're in VR so that you can actually interact with objects while you're there. So I've seen VR products before, but this was really great to see the current state of the art. And I think there's a lot of ways we could work that into our product, especially because they also do what's called AR or augmented reality. You wear goggles and you see the room that you're in as it is, and then things can be overlaid on it. So like for our robots, you could overlay things on top of the robots. When they're battling, you could see laser blasts going between the robots or put them in different environments. So instead of just in your room, you see the robots running around, but maybe now they're in like a grassland instead of just a room with a carpet. Over the last three or four years, they've rapidly iterated and released four different products. And they're doing this on a 12 month cycle from developing it, getting the tech in there, doing all the design, getting new content out there, and then releasing that within 12 months. That's really inspiring to me. I think we can take that as you can do this. If you put your weight behind it and you have the right resources, you can make these really fast, awesome gains. This morning we got a little bit of fresh air. We did a little hiking at Dan Nan Shan, the big south mountain in Shenzhen. We launched right up these really steep steps to get up to this beautiful vantage point that looked over the harbor, the bay, and you could see down onto Shenzhen. There's a lot of high-rise buildings. If you look farther east, there's the real big city center with all the big buildings. And then there's all these islands across the way that are part of Hong Kong, which are, are very beautiful. When I came out here, my brother sent me a message and, and said, uh, oh, you got to send me some photos of the huge buildings there. And uh, so that was definitely a spot where I could get some photos of the buildings for him. So that was one of the things I grabbed up there. Shenzhen is a major modern city in southern China in the Guangdong province population of over 20 million, so it's a bustling metropolis. It feels very new and there's a lot of energy. I was reading that the area of it's quite large, four times the size of San Jose, which is a physically very large city. When you're driving down the main roads, there's just huge building after huge building. Everywhere you look, every building has some crane on it. There's something new going up on every corner. Yeah, you really get the sense that things are exploding here. It was great to be able to hike so close to town and have that great view of Shenzhen and Hong Kong and still be in nature at the same time. So it's our second day in Shenzhen, and this morning we went to Seed Studio, which is a really interesting business. They develop a lot of their own products, but they also help makers and entrepreneurs who have ideas bring a product from what they call Zero, which is just the idea, to the first production-ready prototypes and bring them from that first unit to 10,000 and everything in between. So they have all kinds of prototyping schools. So we went to one of their rooms there where they have 3D printer, big laser cutter, a CNC mill, 
all these kind of tools that you can use to produce almost anything you can think of. All sort of like the tools that engineers drool over. They also had plenty of offices where they make their own products. We met with a lot of their engineers at their office developing the internal products that Seed Studio sells themselves. Seed Studio is mostly focusing on development board type products, so if you're a maker or a hacker and you want to create something new that doesn't exist before, you can use components from Seed Studio to build that, realize that. And we just ran across this little product and project. Uh, the product is called WireLink. It's uh, for smart home automation, so it has a Wi-Fi chip in there. You can hook it up to the internet and then use information from the internet to do things in the physical world. So, for example, this guy is taking weather information from the internet, and then it's got a thermometer over here. Uh, it tells you the weather forecast. We also got to see a really cool project, and it's an open source cell phone kit. It's a modular cell phone kit. The Rephone, I believe it's called. So for people who are makers and want to hack something together, you can make your own smartphone from all of these constituent parts that they provide. Some of the pieces you might already be familiar with, uh, basic pieces like the battery or the touch screen, and then immediately you start getting into the more complex components of the cell phone that you can build, a GPS module, a LED array, a NFC. So one of the other sensors they have here is an ultrasonic range sensor, so you can tell, like, you can put a hand and then you would know like how far away the hand is from the phone, so you could use that as an input, maybe for a game. And then, of course, they let Nick and I try to destroy the little micro drone that they had there. A very small quadcopter, maybe that big. So that's basically four motors with four propellers and a little electronics board at the center. And then you actually use a smartphone to control it. Yeah. <laughs> we tried to fly it around a little bit, but mostly just ended up slamming it into the ceiling and the okay. different walls. Oh, so the red is forward. Oh. <laughs> that would be a good shot. Yeah. The small ones, when they're that small, they're really tough to fly. Yeah. <laughs> they also showed us a few other toys they had. They had a, a cool sort of cube matrix of LEDs and then a little board similar to the ones for the Rephone that had some infrared sensors on it. And so if you move your hand past it in whatever direction, then the lights would light up in that direction. And they also showed us some toy robots, like a Caterpillar that you can drive around. What's similar about this product and what we make is they're both substantially built on a laser cutter. These blocks you see here, that's all laser cut. So this is basically like wood. I and mean, you can 3D print that and make all kinds of shapes by just stacking up 2D shapes into three dimensions. Our product has a much more complicated laser cutting process. It's actually a composite of two sheets of plastic with a sheet of nylon in between. That allows us to do, make frictionless joints and you can move them really rapidly. So that's why the, the robot runs quite fast. We got to meet with Eric, the CEO and founder of Seed Studio. Yeah, I said to have some new friends. He was very knowledgeable about the scene in Shenzhen of just the people and the manufacturing and who to talk to. And also, I think he's been you know all over the world, so he's very familiar with the Bay Area and the culture there and like how the startup scene in Silicon Valley and Shenzhen can work together. Another interesting thing we learned from Eric was this concept of design from manufacturing. You yeah. guys all know DFM, yeah, of course. DFM. From yeah. I think that's for big companies. Uh -huh. You can command the factory and you worry about it. Uh -huh. yeah. But for a small team, for makers, it's more important to look at what uh, these existing processes yeah. and materials. I see. Uh, reuse yeah. them and share the resources for what you want to design. In some cases, the manufacturers and the developers are even in the same room, so you get them directly learning from the manufacturers, and it makes that cycle so fast. Everybody is so plugged in together. So we visited one of the Seed Studios production lines. The Seed Studio one is actually a bit smaller. I know in Shenzhen they have very large ones too. They have the prototype production line set up right next to the actual production line, so it's like very close-knit system. So I think that's one of the advantages of Shenzhen is there's so much manpower here 
that you can spit the boards out from the pick and place machine and then instantly have people testing the boards, doing the final assembly, putting it into a package and shipping it out all within like maybe 5,000 square feet, which is really impressive and not something I've seen in the US. The best part is the people. Yeah. So you've been here for three weeks in Shenzhen. Yeah. Right? And then we got to meet with Joe Hootie. Who is, I believe, a 19 year old from the US, originally from Phoenix, who lives out here. He drops out of college to move out here, which is pretty bold. He's met with President Obama a handful of times on some really interesting projects. Uh, one of them was a air cannon of some sort, uh, which looked pretty fun. As he said, you know, things move a lot faster out here. I think that's true. In Shenzhen, all the manufacturing and prototyping is all in one place. So if you want to get something done, you can just go down the street. Joe started working for Seed a few weeks ago, and uh, he's just getting settled into Shenzhen here himself. He has a little bit of a head start on us, so it was great chatting with him and, and seeing what his experience has been and kind of giving us a sneak preview of things to come. In the afternoon, we got to visit with Chai Huo Makerspace, which was the first makerspace here in Shenzhen. This is definitely on the prototyping side of things and the creative side. It's definitely a mix of art and engineering. It's like this really cool, tight area, uh, lots of neat tools. They do all these sort of uh, meetup groups, learning how to solder, having kids uh, you know, in middle school or even grade school come in here super young to get them in and learning about how to use these different tools, how to work with their hands to build these really interesting devices. Do you know other programming languages? Or they first Java and C++. Okay. Well, yeah. They have a great program set up here uh, for a maker and residence, and they have people from all over the world applying to come here and work on a dedicated project for a few months. And are given the freedom to not worry about a lot of like job or school responsibilities and just make things and be creative. I was speaking with a gentleman named Alex who's working on, effectively it's like an education kit to teach uh, microbiology to high school students, low cost way, something that isn't right now possible. So it's really almost everything under the sun, which I think is great because when you get all these mashups, you have people from different disciplines, from different parts of the world, and you put all that together and you get some ideas that I think you can't get if you don't have that sort of diversity. The guy I talked to, he was from India, and he was working on assistive technologies, mostly for people who have ADD, ADHD, or OCD. So he's using his creativity in both like engineering and art to make the world better for people who have various disabilities or need assistive technologies. So this morning we took a little bit of a road trip out to Dongguang City, which is about an hour's drive from Shenzhen to visit a potential manufacturer that we're interested in working with. The name of the manufacturer is Hobstech. These are guys that we actually talked to before coming here. We were introduced to them by one of our trusted advisors, so we felt very good working with them. In China, you do have to be a little bit concerned about IP issues. So getting that recommendation from someone back stateside that has built reputation up with them is a really big vote of confidence for us. You know the product well, right? Yeah. It's a very good product, yeah. very good. We met so, with Henry, who's the owner of the operation there. Can you show us some of your product? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that yeah. we know a bit more about so, it. We were able to really dive into conversations around the timelines, setting up the contracts, uh, different aspects of the product uh, that we want to make. We talked to Hopstech about working with them, manufacturing the Kamigami robots with them. One of the first steps for that is called an RFQ, or Request for Quote, specifying what our product is, how it works, how it's built, and then they come back with a quote, 
We thought the quote was pretty good, so when we came here, the idea here was really to just check out the factory and see just that the conditions are good, that we think the quality is good, that we can trust them. They're actually a Hong Kong company that moved out here in the early 90s. They used to make mostly toys, which is perfect for us. They understand the market, they understand the pricing structures that uh, we need to reach in order to make the business work. Now they're expanding more into medical devices and other high-end electronics, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connected devices, which is perfect for us. We're building connected toys, so them having experience with software and firmware, as well as all the other mechanical components, uh, it seems like it could be a, a really great relationship for us. Uh, basically, it's 3,000 pieces. Oh, wow. Okay. That's quite good. Yeah. We were taken around the factory floor where we were shown a few key pieces of their operation. Uh, the injection molding where they make the plastic components. Basically, you have two big hunks of metal with cavities inside them. You put them together and you shoot heated plastic at high temperature and pressure and then that's how you make a plastic part, pretty much any plastic part you see. Another interesting thing that we saw was the uh, fabrication facility where they actually make the tools for the injection mold. They had probably a bank of about a dozen CNC machines, so it's a computer navigated cutting tool that they use to mill out the steel blocks that get used for the injection molded components. And then there's a lot of hand assembly. The uh, electronics assembly stations where they actually make the electronic components where they're assembling the different pieces of it. For many of the components, they test every single part to make sure that it works before they send it out. And they do that at almost every step of the way. And then the final pack out and the quality control where the products get assembled before being shipped to the US. The facility was smaller than I expected, but they pack a lot into that size, which is just about everything we need all in one building. Right now, we're doing that across several states in the US. Arizona, California, Minnesota, all has to come together. To do that all in one building will be a big advantage for us, so we're excited about something like that. We're at Jews Fusion Restaurant in Shenzhen. We just finished a really delicious lunch. I'm really full. Really cool experience here. When we first came in, we were introduced to the room that we were going to be dining in, which is this enormous private room, really ornately decorated. There's even a little living room in it, and it's probably about double the size of my apartment. We were introduced to the head chef, who actually took us into the kitchen. And Whoa, there you go. We went to the kitchen, which was really interesting. We got to see the chefs and all the cooks working back there. They did a little bit of the cooking right there in front of us, just uh, dumping the food into this enormous wok that was like afterburner blast of flames coming up onto it. And then they did the plating in front of us. It's all very beautiful, very elaborate. I've never really done that before, like gone behind the scenes in a kitchen. So that was a cool new experience. Then we were guided back into the main dining hall here where the head chef cooked abalone, which is like sort of a really large scallop, which I'd never had before. Oh, there you go. Oh, wow. Sauce it up. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it goes. So done. Mm. It's quick. It's quick. Very quick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, whoa, that's a lot of abalone. <laughs> yeah. Here we go with the abalone. All this right. is the first, first time, time I've had abalone, right? Yeah. You too? Yeah, first yeah. time eating abalone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's really nice, too. It's slightly chewy, but um, not as much as a scallop, maybe. And then the flavor again is sort of like gravy, but it's also very subtle. Nice texture, very tender. And then he also made a really good soup with fish that was raw, and then boiling water with some woodier mushrooms, and I think it's like the inside of a bamboo, which is a really great texture. Doesn't take long. Oh yeah, it's cooked. There we go. 
and some yeah. pumpkin based sauce. Yeah, for the pumpkin. pumpkin. Mm. A little of that on there. Yeah. Hey. Ah. <laughs> All right. Let's try it. <laughs> Oh yeah, nah. it's it's really tasty. It's uh, it's right out of the pot here, so it's so fresh. I don't know if I've ever had fish this fresh before, <laughs> like right out of the pot. Mm. That's really good, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Mm. It basically, just melts yeah. in your mouth. Yeah. And that was excellent. That was one of the best things I had. Just a really interesting mix of flavors and textures. Barbecue oh, pork. Here we go. Mm. Oh yeah, that's also really good. Mm -hmm. mm. It's mm. sweet. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's similar to like a honey glaze. Mm -hmm. Just like undertone of it, but it's not enough to kind of hit you over the face with it. Yeah, it's not like not like a sweet barbecue sauce or something. Mm -hmm. It's just that mm -hmm. subtle hint of honey and yeah. sugar. Yeah. Yeah. It's really tender too. It just kind of comes apart in your mouth. One more. I think we should do yeah, one, right, more. one more. Okay, All right, one more. Yeah. <laughs> So today we did something really fun. We did a quick tour of the winter of the world. It's different from a lot of parks that you might see in the US. It definitely has its own Chinese flavor, but it's a similar concept to the Epcot Center where there's just a little section of the world everywhere. And then they have miniaturized monuments or geographical points of interest. As you drive around, you see a miniature scale version of the Taj Mahal, Mount Fuji, Notre Dame. They also cover a lot of South America. We also took a tour through the Arc de Triomphe, which was quite a large scale structure that they had there. Pretty wild to see that, and a little bit surreal as well to be standing under that in the heart of Shenzhen, looking through the arc and seeing the Eiffel Tower. It's a one to three scale version of the Eiffel Tower, so it's a little over 100 meters tall, and it actually has an elevator that goes all the way to the top. One of the best parts of Window of the World was taking the elevator to the top of the Eiffel Tower. It was the first time that we were up high enough above the city to actually get a 360 degree view of the entire place. Really get a sense of how large Shenzhen is. There's huge buildings in almost every direction you look. The construction is crazy, there's stuff going everywhere. I think at one point we tried to count the number of cranes that we could see on the skyline and we gave up around 50 or so just because it was too ridiculous to keep counting them. We came back down the escalator and did a quick tour of some of the other sites that they had there. You sort of get to experience the whole world in one little trip. There's really a lot there. I could definitely see spending a whole day there. This morning in Shenzhen, we visited the China Urban Youth Robotics Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization. I think they originally started in Hong Kong, but their aim is to bring teenagers together and grow excitement around developing robots and promoting STEM education. They're a high school team that competes in FIRST and other robotic competitions, both at the high school level and at the university level, which is really impressive because they're sort of working above their age. The first thing they showed us was this really cool four-wheeled vehicle. This is an accelerating wheel, mm -hmm. and inside here, inside here is a bullet. Yeah, that's great. It can move like a car, but it can also move like side to side. Has omnidirectional wheels. Battle Royale. Yeah. That has this little cannon on the top that could fire these pellets at some terrifying speed. Oh, oh God! There we go. <laughs> and they shoot them at like almost 100 feet a second. Pretty scary actually, but they use those to fight robot to robot against universities. 
We were also able to play with our robots with them and get their reaction and see what they thought of our products. I was happy that we had the app up in Chinese already and they got to play with our robots, battle them, play a little bit of a, our freeze tag game and also show them our programming interface and, and how it works and get some of those concepts across. We met and spoke with the founder of the Alliance for a while. It was really exciting getting his impression of our product and also how it would fit into the market here in China. He had a lot of really great perspectives about robotics and STEM education in China, the state of STEM education in China versus the U.S. He seemed to think that they were behind and catching up quickly. I definitely think they were catching up quickly. Uh, the facility there is comparable to a lot that we see in the U.S., even in the Bay Area, where it's quite mature. It seems like there could be a really great opportunity for us here. It seems like there's a great hunger for our type of product here in China. If we can get the price right and work with teams like the alliance we met this morning, it seems like uh, it could be a really great partnership. Get these kids involved in robotics at a young age, at a critical age where we want to put them onto STEM studies and inspire them to go and join robotics clubs like the one we visited this morning. Cheers! This afternoon, we went to MakeBlock. MakeBlock is a company founded here in Shenzhen in 2011. It's an open source hardware company developing build-it-yourself robot kits, which is a company somewhat similar to ours. Theirs is made of mostly aluminum. You can program, assemble the different blocks. And then they have all sorts of sensors and like mechanical modules and linkages that you can put on. And uh, their flagship product is called MBOT, which is this cute little wheeled robot that comes with some basic sensors like ultrasonic to do uh, range finding. It can follow lines and then you can add things to it. You can add mechanical things or electronic things. So they had one version where they actually added a linkage so it could walk, which was kind of cool, like a big bug. Their product and our product are similar but also different. They're both about building, which I really like. I think there are a lot of programmable robot toys out there that aren't about building. Ours is a bit more focused on using the software to drive like gaming and the programming and replay value. And theirs is a little bit more based into the hardware of expanding things mechanically and adding a lot more with their aluminum pieces to change the design of the robot. We also spoke with you, who is a graduate of MIT. You worked in the MIT Media Lab and came back to Shenzhen to work at MakeBlock. He knew a lot about the robots and asked a lot of good questions about our robots. MakeBlock was a really cool company for us to visit because they've grown so explosively here in Shenzhen over the past few years. In fact, just in the last year, they've grown from 80 employees to now about 200 employees. They're a few years ahead of us. So it was great having that conversation. And uh, we'll also be looking forward to seeing them at Maker Faire at New York. We're gonna be at some of the same festivals together. So it's great to start that friendship now so we can grow alongside them. This morning, we visited Mayflash in Shenzhen. They are a contract manufacturer that we're considering working with. Mayflash was introduced to us by one of our close company advisors, Charles Huang. Uh, he was the, uh, one of the original inventors of Guitar Hero, which actually Mayflash manufactured for him. So they obviously have a really good reputation. Uh, for the injection, we have some partner factories to make that. We met with Vicky, their marketing director, and Lemon, their uh, sales manager. To talk through their capabilities, how they could help us. Right and they were able to introduce the company to us and show us some example products that they've manufactured in the past. Say Bluetooth. Bluetooth, yeah. Yeah, Bluetooth low energy. Yeah. This is the electronics module. 
and all the different uh, sensors that make up the sensor suite. Uh, the engineers actually had some good suggestions for the product. A few places where we can improve things for both cost and quality. You know, this is our first version of the product, and each version gets better than the last. And so they were immediately able to look at some things and say, hey, I think you could swap this component out, out here and integrate it into another component, and then you're going to save some money and actually improve your quality at the same time, which was really great. Their presentation was really compelling, and then we talked a little bit off camera about quotes and prices um, and quantities. And they put together uh, some really nice terms with us. Uh, yeah, we're excited to see what the next steps are with them. We were able to tour their final assembly line. We got to see some of the line workers working on the final assembly of one of their uh, game control units. It's a sort of an arcade component. It uh, involves a bunch of buttons and switches and also this little joystick component. We saw the workers putting the products together into their final state and then getting ready for quality checks. They mostly make video game controllers, which is uh, not quite what we're doing, but it involves a lot of the same components, electronics, mechanisms, plastic injection molded pieces. So we think they could be a really good fit for us. It was interesting contrasting the operation of Mayflash to Hobbs Tech. Mayflash is a larger organization, but they have different parts of the manufacturing in different facilities. They actually do a subcontract for the injection molding, the plastic parts, which at Hobbs Tech was done all under the same roof. And that was a similar story for the electronics manufacturing as well. With Mayflash, we only got to see the final assembly portion of their facilities. We'd really have to go back to see their electronics manufacturing, and even we'd want to see their subcontractors so we know that the tools are maintained, the workers are trained, the area is safe, everyone's treated well. So for someone like Mayflash, we would want to go back and see the whole process going on before we chose to work with them. One thing we found when evaluating Mayflash or a lot of the companies we meet in Shenzhen is that it is important for us to be there and ask questions and meet them, but there's only so far you can get if you only speak English. And so we're considering hiring a Chinese intern or employee uh, who can speak English and Chinese fluently. I think for those deeper questions about not just do you have quality checks, but what are your quality checks and how do they work and you really want to bore into the details, you really need some help from a Chinese speaker, preferably who has technical knowledge as well, to fully evaluate the manufacturer. This afternoon we visited Orbibo, a smart home automation startup in Shenzhen. So they make a lot of modules and devices and fixtures that bring a home and turn it into a smart home. The main product they have is a Wi-Fi connected socket. You plug it into your socket. It is also a power socket itself that you plug any device into. And then now you can control that device from your smartphone. You can control your lights. You can control the blinds on your windows. You can control your TV, smoke detectors and um, thermostats, things like this. Really anything in the home that you need to turn on and off, you can do through their app uh, because of the hardware they have. So it's an interesting way to look at the home environment and it's changing things quite rapidly. Surprisingly, uh, they're very interested in this product. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we spoke with Jerry, their uh, global business development lead, and also Klaus, their CTO. They were able to give us a tour of their office. Like many of the startups we visited in Shenzhen, it's a pretty big startup, about 150 people. Silicon Valley style offices is, is what I would call it. We were able to see the workforce there, uh, from the industrial design to the product testing to their online sales division, overseas sales. A lot of people working hard on a mix of hardware and software to make beautiful products. 
We spoke a lot with Jerry about what their market looks like here in China for uh, smart devices and how they see that changing moving forward. So it was really interesting to talk through how smart devices are sort of still on the early side of things. They're looking to sort of build awareness amongst the general consumer. They already have a smart meter. They're hopeful that their competition does well and that they can do well and they can all grow together, which I think was a really great perspective. We've been visiting a lot of companies, manufacturers, different startups in Shenzhen, but today it was nice to take a bit of a break and see some cultural sites. Uh, we thought this would be a good way to learn more about Shenzhen and the people here and, and could maybe help us even do business and open up different new conversations and, and understand uh, people here better than just visiting the businesses on their own. This morning we visited Hongfa Temple, which is in the uh, eastern part of Shenzhen. Really gorgeous temple located up on the side of this uh, beautiful mountains. It's pretty big. I think it's probably somewhere around 30,000 square feet or so, so quite a large facility. It's one of the newer temples in China. It was actually the first temple built in Shenzhen and in China since uh, the Cultural Revolution. When you walk into the temple, it's really a whole grounds with multiple buildings, and they're terraced. These terraces connected by staircases with these big platforms in between. The first temple is on a lower level, and then you keep climbing up steps, more and more steps to get to the higher and higher temples. And each platform gives you kind of a view over the surrounding hills and greenery, and it really shows you that Shenzhen is really located in this tropical region because everything is so lush and green. You feel pretty removed. You feel like you're really in nature there with the temple, which just adds to the peacefulness that you feel. There's a lot of people there worshiping, praying, giving fruits as a sort of tribute. The first hall that we visited was uh, the Hall of the Happy Buddha. And you walk in and the first thing you see is this enormous statue of Buddha. And the whole thing is painted in this bright gold. And then on each side of the hall are these enormous statues of the four kings. The second hall we visited was even larger than the first. You walk in and it's this large room and there's three enormous Buddhas all beside each other, about 20 feet tall each, each painted and again in that bright gold color. The part of it that I actually found most interesting was the murals on the side. Very large, elaborate murals done in really vivid paint. And also, the murals were actually carved for a lot of the figures and uh, different scenery, which gave it a real depth to the painting. And behind the Buddha, when you walk around, there's another really amazing statue. It was the Thousand Hand Guayin, which was a statue that, it reminded me of a Hindu statue, but had many, many hands, all holding different things. There's a stamp and there's a paintbrush, there's a knife, there's a cup pouring water. Another cool thing was that in the palm of each of these hands, even though it was holding an object, there was a little space left where an eye was painted. So after we had a tour of the different terraces, we were actually treated to a lunch. It was a Buddhist lunch, so it was vegetarian. The tofu was uh, sort of spongy. It's a really nice texture. It was a little bit spicy, but nothing too crazy. So this afternoon we visited Damesha Beach. And this is where the people of Shenzhen really let it all hang out. It was a pretty wild scene. 
The beach is this huge, long, sandy beach uh, crescent right against the ocean. So it's about over one mile long. The beach is obviously really popular because there were a ton of people there. And I think I heard that there are about 20,000 people there. So even though it was a mile long, it was really crowded. And it's situated in uh, this sort of tropical zone. So as you're looking out, you see all these different green tropical islands. And there's boats driving young families and children all over the place and generally having a blast at the beach. So it was great to be out and get into some nature. Downtown is really fun too with all the tall buildings, but it's also good to get out and see just the expanse of all the mountains and water around you. We had a lot of fun this morning. We visited a company called InMotion. They make all kinds of lightweight electric vehicles. So there they had electric scooters, hoverboard. Their main product uh, is the SCV, or sensor-controlled vehicle. It's like a really small, nimble Segway. We fired up the device and climbed aboard, and at first it's a little bit tricky. You're, you're a little bit timid with the controls because it's kind of balancing back and forth and you're trying to figure it out. You feel a little wobbly and a little bit scared of falling off. <laughs> but really quickly you get on this thing and you, you get more comfortable with it and it can really haul. Within a minute you have the hang of it and you're just zipping around. Right out the window. I'm right behind you. Okay. So we're just getting trained up on these things now. We're just starting to get the hang of it. It's an interesting self-balancing uh, scooter. It has a little handle here. You can steer it around. <laughs> so we've been practicing our just sync, float around. sync dance moves yeah, here. Yeah, synchronized um, scootering. It balances itself, so all you have to do is lean forward a little bit, and it goes forward, and if you lean back, it goes back. Uh, it has a little uh, control input stick here, so if you just tilt it to the right, it turns right. Tilt it to the left, it turns left. And uh, you can get going pretty fast, so I'll just take yeah. off here. The device can go up to 15 kilometers an hour, so it's pretty quick. And we also tried the mono wheel. They also call it a different model of their SCV, but it's one big wheel and there's two foot platforms that come out to the side and you have to get up on both feet and then you can lean to move around. There's no handhold or anything. That one was a lot trickier to get the hang of. It took us a bit of practice to get on that and I don't think yep. we quite got there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Maybe if I were a little bit more athletically inclined, I could have got it quicker. Um, or if I had a little more time. You know, going a little forward, lean forward. Yeah. You gotta move forward. Go. Ah. <laughs> I was able to get going a little bit on it, but it was definitely trickier than the scooter that we were mainly trying. Here we go. Uh, oh, yeah. You're gonna go straight out the window. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> All right. Oh, it's gonna get in now. there. Get in Woo. there. Woo. Oh man! Oh god! <laughs> It's really interesting to see as lithium-ion batteries get cheaper and lighter and as motors get cheaper and lighter and all of this is getting better and more efficient, the different kinds of mobility you can have. So it's a fun way to get around and it was fun to experience for the first time. This afternoon, we're here at Royal. It's a Chinese company based in Shenzhen that also has offices in the Bay Area. They make flexible circuits for touch displays for various uh, mobile electronic devices. We met the CEO, Bill. Shenzhen, you know, this is a really great place for electronics. They've made a lot of rapid progress. It's super impressive. Started with five co-founders, now up to almost 600 people, and they said they're growing to just under 1,000 very quickly. What have been some of the biggest challenges growing, growing a team like that? Uh, we try to divide 
the big team to small groups. Right. And every group has very specific target, specific uh, a goal um, on the project. And, and uh, these different groups can work together very efficiently um, by a uh, system. So it was great to hear his perspective, especially when we're in that early stage of our company. We have a lot to learn from each other. What did you think the uh, hardest part of raising capital was? I think the key thing is you can deliver something at, um, at some specific point mm -hmm. and then you show that to the uh, investors that, yeah. okay, we, we are progressing and we are making really great progress. Right. And you see the great potential there. Mm -hmm. um, so with every you know, milestone, mm -hmm. the new investors will be impressed by your yeah. progress and to see the future and they will be happy to you know, Yeah. Bet. He also got to show the products that they've launched. One of the first products they had was a sort of self-contained like personal movie theater. So it looks very similar to a VR device. It's similar in many ways, but it's got headphones, which are noise canceling, and then the visor. Really crisp display and really beautiful sound. In fact, when I was trying the device, the only way that someone could get me out of it was by tapping me on the shoulder, because you don't have any awareness of what's going on outside of the display. <laughs> and I can see it being really great, especially for a long flight, when you just want to be immersed and you don't want to be bothered and it cuts out all the noise. That's I could see getting one myself, really. <laughs> <laughs> the other main technology they have is these flexible electronics that are seriously impressive piece of technology. They are 0.01 millimeters thick, so that's like a sixth to an eighth the thickness of a human hair, so incredibly thin, and they see it being used on all kinds of technologies. So you could see it from portable, foldable uh, mobile devices to a phone that can expand to the size of a tablet and back again to the size of a phone, which would be really revolutionary. Another application for the technology that seems really promising is flexible displays for car dashboards. So for your car dash, instead of having it just along the flat part, it can go like all the way from here back to here and all curve, no physical buttons. Where you have all the controls laid out onto this flexible display and it's of course all touch sensitive. So you have all the controls right at your fingertips. It's much more stylish and sometimes it's much more ergonomic because you can put those curves in there. They showed off a flexible keyboard as well. Sort of this device, it's like a tubular device that you can actually just extend the screen out of and uh, the technology turns into a keyboard so you can be typing right on your countertop and then when you're done with it, it just retracts back into the tube and you can pop in your pocket and off you go. There's nothing about the structure of the device that makes it a keyboard, it's really just the software, which means it's all reprogrammable. They had a, a phone that was curved. Really cool transparent phone. It had their flexible display built right into it. So they also had this backpack that had their screen built into it so you can make a gesture on the shoulder strap of the backpack and then that corresponds to a display on the back of the backpack. It's really fun to meet other co-founders Really at any stage, you know, it's fun to talk to people who are just starting and it's fun to talk to people who have really made it to those next steps and have a lot of perspective on how to move forward. So this is our last day in Shenzhen and I couldn't think of a better place to visit than the electronics center of the world, Huachon Bay Market. Huachang Bay, which is the incredibly large electronics market in Shenzhen. People come from all over the world to visit Huachang Bay here and source electronic components for prototyping, manufacturing, distribution, anything you can think of. We really wanted to see what was available here. The way it's set up, you have the lower floors is generally more component level parts, like uh, capacitors, cables, LCD screens, LED strips, connectors, really basic building blocks. And as you ascend through the different floors, you get more complex components. So you might have like headphones, cell phones, tablets, Bluetooth speakers, accessory battery packs. 
This is not really like a mall you'd find in the US. I would say it's a somewhere in between a mall and a flea market. So it's set up, it's indoors, but there's not a, too many like big storefronts where you walk in. Most of it is counters. And most of the things don't have a price listed on them. And even if they do have a price, you can usually negotiate down maybe 20% or so we found. We think that if we bought in higher quantities, it's actually a good place to get samples if you're manufacturing. So you could buy a sample here for maybe the Amazon price, and then when you buy 1,000 or 10,000, you get really good prices. So it's really like an outlet for the manufacturers. They're trying to uh, interface with larger suppliers and distributors. One of the great things about this place that we don't really have in the US is it's a one-stop shop for all the parts you need to prototype your hardware designs. So if you want to just build a breadboard of something and do an early prototype of electronics, or even more complicated things, like you need plastic enclosures, some motors, some batteries. You can find all that here and put it together uh, just from parts of Hua Chong Bay. So you come one day, you buy all the stuff you want, you put it together, you see how it works, you come back the next day, all kinds of things you can use to put together these prototypes very rapidly. This is much faster than going on line back home and ordering piece by piece where you have to wait in between to get different components. When it comes to developing hardware products, there's really nowhere better to be than here. This is really the hardware product center of the world. If New York is the center of the world for financials, this is the center of the world for hardware development. The trip definitely exceeded my expectations. Just some of the meals we've had, eating in the Jews restaurant was excellent, got to meet the chef. Going to the Buddhist temple and seeing how people worship. I think the highlights for me in Shenzhen really comes down to just how much is happening here. It's so active. We met a ton of really impressive CEOs here in Shenzhen. Eric from Seed, because he's so embedded in this community that we're a part of. Bill from Royal, he was really impressive what he's done with his company with really exciting technology. It was also inspiring to meet Ms. Wong, from the CEO of Three Glasses, really leading the way in some high-end 3D virtual reality headsets. This experience definitely helped us a lot understanding what goes on in Shenzhen, what we need to do when we're here. Big themes on this trip have been innovation and growth. At the end of the trip, I feel excited to go back. I feel like we just barely scratched the surface and uh, we'll be coming back for sure. It's just a matter of how soon we can come back and really dig in.